So what we're effectively trying to do is remember yesterday very accurately at extremely high scale. What actually happens when a demand side platform engages machine learning to boost your bids? Hello and welcome to Growth Masterminds. My name is John Katsir. Using machine learning, of course, in mobile advertising and to drive bidding is super interesting. There's less data to drive decisions than ever before. Makes it more and more critical to use each possible piece of data you can get and use it well. So how did DSPs do it? Here to chat is Joseph Iris. He's the director of ML products at Personally. Welcome, Joseph. Thanks, John. Nice meeting you. Great to meet you as well. Let's start with the signals. What signals feed into machine learning for bidding? So the, it all starts in what uh, we get in the requests from the exchanges, right? Uh, obviously, uh, up until recently with everything with uh, iOS and privacy, the device ID was like the biggest factor in it. But over time, as we go into a more private, privacy oriented ecosystem, uh, then, uh, that signal is becoming less and less significant and you can't really rely on them. So other than that, you have signals regarding the user's connection, which ISP is coming from. Uh, those things, even though they sound very, uh, not necessarily related to the user's like actual engagement with ads, sometimes those things are useful as well. Uh, you get additional mm -hmm. contextual signals from each exchange, sometimes, uh, it, uh, it, it, back in the day, it used to even include like the level of battery still left, but those things are kind of, uh, not, not there anymore. Uh, but basically they try to give you additional signs into what sort of mindset the user is inside. Uh, one problem there is that it's not unanimous, uh, across the board, like each exchange tries its own different stuff. So, so the things that you can rely on is obviously the publisher. You can use machine learning in order to manufacture around of, uh, uh, features around uh, what that publisher means, is contextual relationship with the uh, app you're promoting, uh, it's in, uh, prior performance, and basically you can learn a lot from that. There's device enrichment, which is significant. So uh, on iOS, it's not really relevant because you have a very limited uh, list of devices, but on Android, it's insane, right? We have like mm -hmm. tons of vendors, <laughs> tons of models, and uh, um, as, as time progressed, uh, you could, you were able to, let's say, differentiate between a high value, uh, phone from a feature phone pretty easily, but it's becoming more difficult mm -hmm. as, you know, manufacturing costs decrease and you can get like really strong, uh, non brand phones, right? So, uh, with device enrichment, we take the device UA string, which is obviously not connected to anyone's identity. So that's going to stick around and we can enrich it with, uh, the pixel density of the device, the number of calls, uh, the RAM and everything to create like a profile of the device. And this way we can create different device segmentation again, to differentiate between high value users and also connected to the context. Uh, other than this, um, um, there are session signals that are coming from the exchanges as well. Uh, because they uh, do know uh, where the user is placed inside the session. So mm -hmm. that is very informative uh, in regards to like the prob probability of clicking, installing and everything like that. So uh, when you say session, are you, are you talking about how long somebody has been in a particular app yeah. or how active they are? Yeah. yeah. I, I know that some exchanges try to do this like at a multiple app level, uh, but again, uh, in the future, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be just uh, for the current publisher. It no, is what it is. no. I, I do exactly. want to set like the 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 tone of like the usage of machine learning for our use case, right? Because um, marketers uh, and me in my past life tend to you know over glorify uh, any any tool that you would actually use to do anything, right? And with machine learning, it's easy because it sounds <laughs> like it's from the future. Um, and stuff like that, especially, you know, with, with every, all the buzz around it, with chat GPT and everything, and, you know, a, a lay person or not necessarily a lay person, even technical people using this tool would be amazed by its capabilities. But, uh, 
the way I like to describe it uh, to prospects and, and like people that don't really understand the industry, like my wife, no, no offense, but obviously she's not really connected. She's a dog trainer, you know, there's a big gap. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're effectively trying to do is remember yesterday very accurately at extremely high scale, right? So the, the, the assumption of any machine learning based prediction is that reality didn't change dramatically from yesterday. Uh, and, and when it comes to at least our use case, um, there weren't any significant breakthroughs, uh, in terms of like the, the underlying math, uh, under like all of this compute and how we can now scale training much faster. And it's like a click. Uh, to set up a huge cluster of devices on the cloud or on whatever infrastructure you use. It's all the same concepts that most people know around uh, statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, this should really reduce the, the entry barrier to at least discussing it, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, when, mm -hmm. when you frame it that way, it's no longer this magical black box that you can't understand. Uh, it's basically a tool trying to remember yesterday, right? That's like much more approachable and that's the reality. Is there any other data that you use that is maybe contextual data or, or other data that, that isn't necessarily confined to what you're getting from an exchange, you know, there's, there's time of day, there's seasonality, there's other things like that. There's, there's also, and, and you mentioned this, your assumption is that today is pretty much like yesterday. Well, if today is a Super Bowl, today is not like yesterday, yes. right? So, so are you feeding in things like that? Yeah. So you need to factor in really dramatic events, uh, the change stuff, uh, you have features for that you enrich your data with like, is today a holiday or is today like a dramatic event in some market? And that way it could expect it. Uh, but the reality of being able to adapt to those things quickly is by training incrementally instead of retraining your data like every day or every hour is to basically stream your learning. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we operate in that way. So, so if reality is starting to change, like imagine like the beginning of COVID stuff changed, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so it, as long as your pipeline is adaptable and it understands that like the latest current trends are more important, and that is always done with like weights that you apply to the more recent, uh, samples, then you're pretty much fine. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. other than this, mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of stuff that we do with context, uh, comes from us preparing for the future of, uh, let's call it, let's call it interest groups the same way that, uh, uh, Google calls it in their plans for the privacy cloud is to yes, topics. Create, yeah, create cohorts based on their engagement, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, segments, right. Of like the, the categories, I can't really call it categories because store categories are filled with lies and you kind of need to create your yes, own. They are you filled with lies. Yeah. <laughs> the, that's uh, ASO people. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan, don't get me wrong, but it makes our job more difficult, right? We need to, so. The, I am not when... a fan. I am definitely <laughs> not a fan. I'm, I'm almost like, you know, where's, where's Apple or Google as a dictator saying, this is your category, uh, stick in your category. <laughs> so one <laughs> People thing picking we're, new categories all the time. One thing we're lucky about is that when you're building your uh, app store page, the description kind of has to reflect what's inside the app. Otherwise the users are going to be very upset very quickly. Uh, you remember the days of the fake ads <laughs> the, yes. that, that doesn't end well, uh, eventually, right? <laughs> are those days a, over? Uh, sure kind, of, are. kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, not fully over, but it's not, you know, it's, it, there was, there were a few months where it was like basically everything. So, uh, in order to not be contaminated by ASO, uh, we take the store descriptions themselves uh, and this is where we can actually use the more uh, robust models that we don't necessarily understand what happens under the hood uh, to understand the context. So when uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you don't know this and time goes by so quickly, I think it was even three years ago when the whole scan conversation started, uh, 
we understood, okay, it's time to uh, adapt to a reality where the user no longer exists. And uh, we designed mm-hmm. a solution around using the store descriptions because we said, okay, you're not going to change that into something that doesn't make sense. It always has to mm-hmm. uh, consider like the features that you're offering, uh, the theme, and what makes you different. Uh, there's also a lot of trash in there uh, around like, uh, you know, legalities and stuff you kind of have to say. So one 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 of the most important things in machine learning is is this sentence which is like amazing if you think about it uh, it's trash in trash out if you input the wrong data into your model you're gonna get something completely useless mm-hmm. uh, the technologies are mm-hmm. all established as i said before there are no groundbreaking things really happening you're just computing faster uh, and getting yep. more accurate but again, the concepts are the same. Mm-hmm. So as long as you clean up your input, you make sure it's relevant, you help the machine learning to stay relevant, you're going to get good outputs out of this. So what we did, and I'd be happy to, happy to demo it, uh, uh, this is a, around like how we use context uh, like to the best of our ability. Uh, I'll, I'll describe it first and then I'll use like stuff to show it. Um, uh, we take the store description uh, of the promoted app. And we also scrape all the store descriptions of all the apps in the wild where we can actually have access to their inventory. Uh, we uh, then create a vector representation. We embed it into something uh, mathematical that we can use that represents uh, its context. And then when you have two vectors, you can measure the distance between them. So this allows us to say, mm-hmm. for example, if you're promoting a boxing app, Anything that has the words boxing or fighting are going to be very, very close uh, and they're going to have a high score. We normalize it to like a, a score between one, a zero to one. So it's going to be really near one. Then you go further away, you will go to other sports, you go further away, to you go to sports news until you reach stuff that are completely unrelated. Uh, so when we designed it this way, we thought about A, not wanting to take stuff ourselves because that sounds like a nightmare uh, to maintain. A lot of companies do that, not just in our uh, industry. Like tagging mm-hmm. is like a huge, uh, it's, it's becoming an industry. Uh, tagging mm-hmm. annotation, I think that's like how you would call it, like this whole field. Uh, we don't want to do that stuff. We're too lazy, I guess. We want, to, we want something that's like automatic. So we basically build this process that constantly scrapes the stores for any changes or new apps. We feed this into this already established data set. And for each new app, we can say, okay, yeah, this is its context. Uh, then we we had a case There's study. There's probably a product right there, actually, which is a new way of categorizing apps, which is just, <laughs> I'm not categorizing them how they say they're categorized. I'm categorizing them how they're actually categorized. Yeah, yeah. The, there's definitely room to, to add the insights into the industry. That we didn't go that far. It's basically a proprietary tool for us. Uh, so yeah, I can show you, uh, let me find the button to do that stuff. Uh, this is accessible for a website, just Google context distance calculator with the top score because apparently people don't use that. Uh, so yeah, inside the app description, you have keywords, uh, and, uh, the keywords, we actually detect them by their frequency. Uh, there's a term in, uh, everything related to. Uh, machine learning and, and uh, managing text in uh, natural language processing. It's called TFIDF. Again, sounds crazy, but it's very simple. It's term frequency inverse to the document frequency. It's basically the rarity mm-hmm. of the word against like the entire corpus. Uh, so if a word is more rare, it would get higher weight because it expresses yeah. the context higher. So we use the model called ELMO. Uh, a lot of the models in, in, in this field in EdTech come from uh, uh, MuppetNet. <laughs> so it started with Elmo, then it was Bert, and then it, uh, so it's kind of funny. I don't know why they use that. To get that because they teach words, I guess. That kind of makes sense if I think about it. So uh, we use this already established model in order to create the embedding, and we apply the weights according to the rarity of the words because these express the context. So as you can see in this example, uh, words that appear uh, less and combination of words that appear less and are more rare, get higher weights. This way we get a, an app representation and we can measure distances. 
And if I take a couple of demos that I have here, uh, if we take home Homescapes, for example, you can see that it's going to find, uh, we, we show only like the top 20. So usually you only select the top, uh, the, more, the closest ones. So you can see obviously some of the direct competitors and some stuff that like use similar features, but not necessarily the exact same thing. Uh, if you go for dating uh, and I chose Bumble, I didn't use a dating app ever because I'm old. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think that's a popular one with the kids. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can see that here it's, it's very easy to understand the context, right? The keywords are mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. upfront and they tell you exactly what they are. Uh, and when it comes to things that are more complex, this can, of course, hit or miss. But the right thing to do here when you design a campaign using this sort of tool for either scan or uh, probabilistic attribution is to just build your campaign structure around this and use it as a model, as a feature in the model. So eventually it understands, okay, if this is a close context, is it good or is it bad for my performance? Because sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be good, adjust accordingly, a bit less, a bit more. Uh, but yeah, this was our way of do making it like future proof and not needing to keep doing it manually. It's super interesting to hear this understanding of context in the app world, because of course, there's always been context on the web, right? And, and context on the web is pretty easy because as you're deciding what ad to put on uh, a page, you know a lot about that domain, you know a lot about the content on that page, it's easily scrapable, it's easily understandable, and, and, and so you have a lot of contextual data. But in-app doesn't have those kind of realities, doesn't have those kind of accessible pages to a scraper or, or, or something like that. So it's a super interesting way to look at context and, 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 and how it works. Um, love it. Talk about creative. How does creative come into your models? Yeah. So when, when we came, like when we originally designed the system, we started just with A-B testing, but we, we very quickly, we understood that it's not. I mean, you can build all sorts of automations around it to make it effective and make sure it's statistical and you have people that make careers out of it. And, and yeah, sometimes that's, that can be the right tool, but, but in our use case, when everything moves really quickly, we, we understood we have to leverage more advanced technology. So, um, the, the way we approached it, and by the way, we, we look at it very differently from a UA manager. For us, the creative is a tool, uh, for UA managers. Uh, it's a tool as well, but there's a lot more thought going into uh, what you're putting inside it. You know, there's the huge art teams. Brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does so, this look like and, our app? All and, that and stuff. That, yeah. that makes sense, right? I mean, that needs to happen. But uh, we, we, we read this, we need to focus on, on taking what we get and just making it the most useful uh, tool for us to collect observations and samples faster and more effectively. So in order to train our models for new partners where we kind of have a cold start problem, we have to collect sample quickly. Otherwise they'd be like, I'm not going to spend $50,000 in exploring with you because I don't see anything happening. Uh, so we built a solution. Uh, a, this, a, a, there's a different field, the more advanced fields in machine learning called reinforcement learning. Uh, that's the, the field that's used for training bots that you'd play against in video games and stuff like that, uh, because it has mechanism to give the machine rewards and punishments based on its actions. Uh, so, uh, the, the tool we're using has a double bombastic name, uh, a multi-arm bandits, which is actually coming yes. from the one arm bandit analogy, uh, of a slot mm -hmm. machine because the theoretical problem they were trying to solve was which slot machine do you play with, you know, to increase your odds. Uh, so in effect, what it is, again, it's, it's much more simplistic. Um, we have the capability to know each creative CTR and IPM in real time. Uh, the, it's not simple to store this data and serve it very quickly and update it with each new observation that you get, each new impression, click, etc. 
we figured that part out and we were able to scale it. Um, and this way, you start off uh, without knowing anything, but as soon as you get the first signal, you have a champion and you can start giving it more uh, of your traffic. So you're not, you're effectively A-B testing in real time with much more than two uh, uh, vari uh, variations and, and you can mm -hmm. adjust very quickly. So over time, as the champion or champions become more statistically significant, uh, they get more of the weight. They get, let's say, up to 85, 90% of the traffic. And the other remaining 10% are still left there for exploration uh, for the option of new champions to emerge. Uh, in some cases, we, we can have like social casino apps that have the same champion for a year. That just happens. Sometimes uh, the stars align, something about how the coins are dropping from the sky is just getting people to install. Uh, and, and you'll see situations where this, like, uh, the table of champions doesn't really change. Like number one is number one, but in other cases where you introduce new, uh, uh, you know, the, the creative teams that are a bit more, uh, how do you call it? Adventurous. You can have things shifting all the time. So we had to build something that can always explore. Uh, this is a pretty robust solution as is. I mean, as far as we can tell, um, it really fits the use case. Uh, one thing that's missing from it, ironically, based on all of our conversations so far, is context. Uh, because this mm -hmm. uh, solution is designed for one champion at a given time. Uh, but of course, when you're targeting users, you have much more than one persona. Uh, so the, yeah. the next iteration we're working on, and I'm hoping to release uh, this quarter, is basically adding context into this. So. When you're selecting the champion, you'll have different cohorts uh, that get different champions based on the feature. Uh, so this way you'll get an additional boost. Super, super interesting. It's funny you talked about those creatives that, that are just winning for like a year or something like that. I've called those unicorn creatives. <laughs> and, and I've seen that from, from, from marketers in the past where there's been just this one unicorn creative they can't beat. They just can't beat it. They mm -hmm. try, they're beating their heads against the wall and they can't win against this one creative. Yeah. It's a good problem to have. It means yeah. that something is just working really, really well, but it can be frustrating for, for marketers. It's also interesting that you're using about 10% of the budget for testing. It's kind of the testing tax, right? You need to do that. You need yeah. to find your next unicorn creative, your next one that works really well. I guess the big question is, what are the signals that mean success to you as a DSP, is it a click? Cause that's pretty easy to game, right? Yeah. Somebody just shoots up an SK overlay. Yeah, when yeah, you yeah. look at this playable ad, you didn't do anything, but boom, you're in the app store almost, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and other that, things like that. That happens on Android like, as well. How much I mean, down... It's not just iOS, no, yeah. That's like, it's not just SK overlay. Yeah, how, mu how much? It's just, it's just Go the reality, ahead. like you said, like clicks are, I mean, for, for years, clicks haven't been like what they used to be. You know what I mean? Uh, a click doesn't yes. necessarily mean <laughs> <they> it. ever. <laughs> ah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I mean. At some period in time, they probably were, but when we came into this, uh, field, this was like after like six, seven years of, of a tech experience already, but building this programmatic, uh, tool at this crazy scale, when you're processing, uh, you know, 3 million queries a second and you have still have room to grow, uh, teaches you things quickly. Like reality hits you hard, very quickly. Life comes at you fast, as you say. So very quickly we, we assumed, okay, okay, let's say, let's assume we got rid of all the, uh, BS in EdTech, right? We're not buying anything fraudulent. We're directly integrated with all the major SSPs, you know, Unity, App Loving, all those good guys, right? Uh, so we said, okay, it would be enough just to get a good CPI. And from there, everything's gonna work itself out, right? These are real humans. The apps converted like 5% from install to purchase. We're gonna be fine. No, definitely not. Especially when you're trying to optimize towards a lower CPI. Uh, the, the predictions are always, uh, uh, I think you say diametrically opposed to one another, right? So, if a user has a high probability of clicking or installing, 
is going to have a low probability of becoming a high value user in most cases. It's very rare that the stars align and all the probabilities are high. Um, so uh, as we learned this, and we were uh, uh, like those uh, marketers from before, breaking our heads against the wall of why uh, these users that are clicking are not really installing or paying, we figured out that, yeah, we, you can't rely on those signals. Not at all, because obviously they affect attribution, but you need to treat them with a grain of salt and with all sorts of tools in machine learning, give them less weight. So when, mm -hmm. like the, the full string of predictions we do for a single ad request consists of predicting the option price for bid shading. We can get into that later. That's really interesting in, in and of itself. Predicting the probability of a click, an install given a click, a, a post-install event, or, or, or even, you know, an LTV, or something about like quality and the value it reflects for the advertiser, depending on his KPI, uh, and the probability of a view for attribution. But, but that's like, uh, that's a lesser part of this, uh, because you, you multiply the first three and view for comes in at the, at the end. So when you're looking at this, the things that matter most are the, 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 the CTI, that conversion, the click to install and the post install one. Mm -hmm. So those are given mm -hmm. like significantly higher weight in anything that we consider. Everything else is a tool in order to get those targets so we can train effectively. It, it's, it's, it's funny because as you're talking about that, as you're talking about the signals that you could potentially look at and, and then the one that you really care about, this click to install, and your machine learning model is trying to compute all that in a couple hundred milliseconds. Yeah. And I'm thinking you're, you're boxing in the dark while you have a blindfold on, while your hands are tied behind your back. <laughs> How many other hurdles can I put in your way? Right. Uh... While, while you're standing on a ladder over a, over a, a thousand meter fall, because you don't know anything about that person who's viewing that ad or potentially viewing that ad because of course we're in the era of privacy yeah. on SCAD network you know you you just don't know you have to go on this context and and that's soon going to be the case yeah largely the case on android as well as privacy sandbox comes in there are you using any SKAD network data, does that impact anything that you're doing in real time in those couple hundred milliseconds? So right now it's still limited, obviously, because it, uh, there's not a lot of advertisers that are like, is that a no? <laughs> no, 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 it's not a no at all, because obviously we have to prepare for the future. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. we still live in a different reality, but we have to prepare for tomorrow or the rainy day, however you want to call it. Uh, so, uh, uh, the same concept of waiting, it works in the same way now. So because those signals are not specific at all, even with scan four, like the lowest level, you know, it's very different from anything deterministic or probabilistic where you can still tie it to a transaction. So you have to treat it with a grain of salt and build your like scheme around it. And that's what we do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. interesting. <clears throat> so, uh, with this new structure of, of scan four, where, where you do get more detailed information. So again, we weight, uh, the signal according to how much it's, uh, uh, they say course and what's the other word. Um, so you have, fine. yeah, yeah. So the refined, so those get higher weights, course ones get still some reward, but they're not as close to the significant ones. Uh, and, and we can use it. Mm -hmm. It's just, so, so this shift towards, uh, less signal for us, uh, was scary at first, but when you saw the dynamic of the market, uh, changing, uh, so rapidly. So what happened when, when first, when this whole, like, uh, ATT came into play, all the budgets went to Android, right? Uh, and the prices on iOS, like, yeah. plummeted. Yeah. That means that even if you can yeah. classify the same way you can before, as long as you can still classify, you can play the game. So I, I you can, know, and the yeah, funny thing was, 
the smart money stayed on iOS. The smart money stayed on iOS yeah. because just because you couldn't measure success didn't mean you didn't yeah. have success. It was just very so if you A had some faith or B had alternate means of measurement, as in maybe triple M, media mix modeling, or other things like that, or C figured out SK Ad Network really, really quickly because you can make it performant if you know how to do it and if you have the right tools to do it. You had a huge advantage for a couple months there, maybe even even existing to a certain extent till today because mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's still marketers that have stayed away from it, still haven't figured out SK Ad Network. Then you had a big advantage. But it's hard for me to understand how scan data can make it into your machine learning models because not only is it aggregate and therefore not um, tied to a specific device or anything like that, it's also delayed. Yeah. And the delays in scan four are significant. We're talking easily 35 days. So with in ethic, some cases. With ethic and machine learning, uh, you kind of have to get ready for delayed feedback and what's called sense of data out of the box because that's the way attribution works. So when you have a click attribution window open for seven days and you want to train so frequently, so you have to have tools built in, assuming that uh, the impressions you're getting now can turn into installs uh, later. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, in just adjusting mm -hmm. to that is not so difficult. Uh, adjusting to the reality that you can't connect uh, a, an install to an impression obviously is much harder. Uh, but as long as you map mm -hmm. what you're buying to the lowest degree you can, uh, based on how you get the, the data back from Apple. When it was 100 IDs, we had a case study uh, with Tilting Point where we were actually able to leverage that and get better performance uh, on uh, right. than the normal iOS traffic at the time. But then it was mostly because it was the savvy users not getting ads, right? Not just everyone, uh, because they knew how to opt out behind like eight screens inside the settings on iOS. So, so. You factor it in this way, you use weights in order to give higher uh, importance to where you actually know, you know, the publisher app or uh, the ad set, and, like the, the deeper levels and uh, hope mm -hmm. for the best. Just kidding. But I mean, that's, I mean, you still need to, <laughs> you know, design, design the campaigns in, the, in a way where you'll still, you know, get enough signal to keep this going. But again, the prices always what? adjust. Uh, to your capability, uh, to our capability and any performance based buyer that actually has a machine learning capabilities because we set the tone, right? Performance buyers are the only ones that are able to mm -hmm. lead crazy high CPMs uh, on UA. Retargeting is a different story. But on UA, we're the only yeah. companies that can say, okay, this, the, this impression hides a hundred IPM under it somehow, right? So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, you asked before about like the, the, the decrease. So I, I can give you some numbers actually about like what the impact was. So let's say. Yeah. And so, so mm -hmm. there's context because this was before we started recording. Yeah. Yeah, I've been wondering for some time on, you know, where are we in terms of ad efficiency on iOS specifically? And we'll talk about Android in a year or two or something yeah. like that. But, you know, we're, if our level with IDFA pre ATT was one. Right. Yeah. You know, let's say that was our efficiency was one. What is our efficiency now with scan three and maybe thinking about scan four? Is our efficiency 0.5? Is it 0.3? Is it 0.7? Is it a range depending on how well we understand scan and how to advertise in this reality? Throw it over to you. So obviously there are a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, one being like the prominence of the promoted app. The more popular it is, the easier it is to actually work with scan. But, but generally uh, speaking, I can give you a, an example that I know the numbers of because I looked at a lot. Casual games, of course, are a big uh, part of our uh, mix uh, when, when we like with our UA partners. So the, when we look at like our ability to classify uh, and discriminate and bid higher and lower based on like the predicted IPM or the post install. Uh, uh, event probability, the IPM range we would see for casual games, usually from the lowest probability to the highest, would be between, you know, basically no no installs, zero IPM, to around 20. This was pre-ATT, 
and this is you know the, the reality in, in Android uh, to some degree. Uh, post ATT, it decreased from zero to five. So it, so if you look at like sheer numbers, that's like twenty five percent efficiency uh, versus what we had before. But prices decreased by even wow. more than that. Uh, so. So th again, this kind of balance is a doubt and proves as an opportunity for, for smarter buyers, like you said before. So interesting, so interesting. So y you think about the broader impacts of that, right? There, there's obviously the specific impacts in terms of ad tech, in terms of publishers and advertisers. Okay, we're 25% as efficient, but our costs drop more. So in the end, we don't really care about that. What are the bigger environmental impacts that ads are cheaper? Are you going to see more ads, right? Ad mm -hmm. Ads are less effective. Are you going to see worse ads? We don't have time to get into all that right now, but that's absolutely fascinating and something I'll probably dive into in a blog post or something like that. We have to bring this to an end. This has been super interesting. It's been super informative. I absolutely love the things that you've been talking about. We have to bring this to an end. I want to end here. What signals are most predictive? Is it context in terms of the app um, description, app listing? Is, is it something else? What signals do you find are most predictive? So in reality, most of them by themselves are not meaningless, but are not enough to, to get you what you need. Right? Almost so, meaningless. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So, so the classic example, like one of the first tasks you would uh, run as a machine learning uh, practitioner would be to predict the price of a house, right? Uh, that's like the, the classic use case. And the features for that are like the number of rooms and, uh, you know, how many stairs mm -hmm. are in the house, is there a basement, stuff like that. And, and you create an equation that says, based on each of these different things, what's the price going to be uh, based on prior knowledge. Uh, the the reality eventually comes from all of these interactions between these features. So at face value, let's say if a user is just at the start of a session, that means nothing. But if he's in the start of a session, and this is a similar context to the context he's playing right now, and it's 8 p.m. and the Super Bowl was yesterday, for example, then at this point, you have a very specific reality that can suddenly bring you that 20, 30, 40 IPM. So it, it's never a single feature by itself. Uh, it's always a combination of a few things. They usually come around the session. The session is very strong as long as you know how to use it because uh, users' uh, attention spans are short. So usually in most contexts, the beginning of a session is better because they're more open to learn about new things. Uh, but it has to come in conjunction with the context they're in, the overall context or like the, the context of the cohort and, and still taking into account things that sound like they're meaningless, like the ISP, as I said before. But again, when you combine it with all of these and you have enough information, they can get you to this very specific uh, case where, yeah, like, again, the stars align. I use that sentence a lot, but... You kind of need that when, when you're designing. So as long as... Essentially as long, what you're saying is that machine learning and finding the right ad for the right person at the right time is basically astrology because the stars <laughs> have to align. It's, it, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, you know, when I read uh, every... I used to do it when I was younger, you know, just open the newspaper and read like your the predictions. So yeah, those are... Uh, you, the ones you get there are very generic, right? You're gonna have a bad time. You're gonna lose something, you know. So, so with Attic, it's it's it, you're you will meet to... somebody new today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so in in our case, it, yeah, you need to be more specific, but but kind of yeah, because if you think about what astrologists are doing, is just yeah. So in many cases, last week you probably you know these things happen. You were frustrated. You, you know, usual things that happen in everyday life are going to happen tomorrow. Something bad happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so kind of. But yeah, um, it is very mathematical and very like scientific method oriented. Yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter how much signal you have. If you set up the correct uh, tools, you clean up the data correctly, 
you work with the reality that you have and you adapt quickly, which is the most important thing in, in the world right now, I think, with everything changing so rapidly, you can compete. And, and, and that's why I work so long, so such long hours, because I believe we can, we can do this even more effectively. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, we've gone from science to astrology to fortune <laughs> cookies to, um, you know what, <laughs> do your homework and good things can happen. Yep. Joseph, this has been super informative and also quite a bit of fun. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Happy to be here.